Welcome, everyone. My name is Omari Wooden with the U.S. Census Bureau, and I'd like to welcome everyone listening into today's podcast, The Hidden Gems of Economic Indicators, where we're going to discuss economic business data, specifically indicator data and the U.S. International Trade and Goods and Services Report. The Census Bureau measures America's people, places, and economy. We provide a wide range of data to help businesses in your area succeed and grow, and to help you make data-driven decisions. We conduct surveys and release data monthly, quarterly, and annually, as well as an economic census and census of governments every five years, and other periodic reports. We provide data on various sectors of the economy, including construction, manufacturing, wholesale trade, retail trade, and services. But today, we're going to be focusing on international trade. So it's interesting, when people think about the Census Bureau, you think about, again, people and businesses. But you don't always think about international trade, imports from Germany, exports to Brazil. But today, we're going to take a deeper dive. I'd like to first introduce Matt Prisbaki. Welcome. Thanks, Amari. Really good to be here. So, Matt, you and I have worked together on international trade for a long time. I think we both grew up in international trade. It's great to have you on today. And before we get started, just look at the teamwork here. We've got a Baltimore Ravens fan and a Pittsburgh Steelers fan coming together for a good cause. That, that's crazy, right? Oh, that's it. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about Lamar Jackson and Ben Roethlisberger later. But so, again, I know you, but let me introduce you to everyone. Matt is the assistant division chief over the International Trade Indicator Program in our Economic Indicators Division here at Census. So, international trade. You and I have attended conferences to share on trade data, export compliance and regulations, but what's crazy is we still get asked from time to time if we're there to count people at the conference. That's crazy, right? Yeah. So we have all types of data here at Census. During our last podcast, I talked with Scott Sheeler about the quarterly services survey. Great information for those listening. You can find that podcast on the Census Bureau's YouTube channel, or just search Census, Podcast, and Indicator. But again, today we're going to be focusing on international trade, which is a monthly indicator. As I stated in the introduction, we do five-year surveys, annual surveys, quarterly, and monthly indicators. Can you explain to me what an indicator is and what exactly does that mean? Yeah, so what is an indicator? I guess that's as good a place to start as any. An economic indicator is a snapshot of economic data used by investors, businesses, and policymakers to interpret current or future investment possibilities and really judge the overall health of the economy. At the Census Bureau, we produce 13 of these indicators, nine monthly and four quarterly. In the International Trade Program, we release one monthly indicator, the U.S. International Trade and Goods and Services Report. So it's interesting that you mentioned monthly and quarterly data. I mentioned earlier there's a five-year census, both for economic and government data. So what's the difference between an economic indicator, an annual survey, and a five-year census program? For most sectors, the indicators, annual, and five-year census programs work together to measure a given part of the economy. For example, the indicator survey provides the most timely information, but isn't always at the finest level of detail as far as geography, products, and so on. The annual survey adds more detail, such as adding information on expenses or payroll or products, but on a more delayed basis. And then you have the five-year census. That serves as the foundation for many of our programs due to the comprehensive coverage it provides across products, industries, and geographies. But because of that granularity, it takes most time to process and release. Okay, that's a good distinction between the different types of programs. Just want to establish a foundation for those that are listening. The longer the time, the more detail it can be provided. The more timely, it's more a snapshot of the industry. Okay. So back to international trade. So tell me more about the program and what's going on. For those who knew us back in the day, we were the Foreign Trade Division. Now known as International Trade, that's exactly what we cover. We provide detailed statistics on physical goods and estimates of services delivered from the U.S. to foreign countries. Those are our exports. And those entering the U.S. from foreign countries are imports. Now sit back. I'm about to give you a lot of information, but believe me, it's all great stuff. All right, let's go. Fun fact. 
Distinct from the other indicators, we are less like a survey and more like a census. There are some survey aspects, but in general, we extract and process all export and import records for the United States. If we were a trade survey, we would have a representative sample of all the exports and imports, but we get everything. Now here's some legal jargon. The Code of Federal Regulations, Title 15, Part 30, specifically requires reporting to customs for all exports over $2,500 and imports over $2,000, or lower in some cases, like in textiles. And this is per 10-digit commodity classification code. In effect, we are a mandatory survey. That's interesting. So when people hear survey, they normally think about something that they're getting in the mail or being directed to complete something like a survey online. That is absolutely true. But I'm sure the listeners are wondering, how in the world do we collect everyone's shipment information? Well, we don't mail, email, or call for our data. Most of the data are actually filed through the Automated Commercial Environment, or ACE, Secure Data Portal. Man, that is a mouthful. Export reporting in ACE goes through the Automated Export System, or AES. And import reporting is separate side of the web-based application. While we use ACE for data collection, several other government agencies, such as Customs and Border Protection, use it for export enforcement. And it serves as a single window or environment where exporters, importers, and others involved in the U.S. side of trade can access shipments, details, and required documents. We also have a data exchange with Canada. Each country sends its own import data to the other, which publishes it as export data. As one of our largest trading partners, the U.S.-Canada data exchange saves a lot of time and reporting burden for our U.S. exporters to Canada. We publish that data in the monthly international trade report. I've been focused on the goods because census processes that part of the release. It's actually a joint release with our sister commerce agency, the Bureau of Economic Analysis. They provide the services component as well as the balance of payment adjustments for exports and imports. So everyone is clear. When you mention goods, you're talking about physical products you can touch, correct? Like fruit, a machine, a toy. So services are kind of like activities, right? Exactly. So even though we're not focusing on services, what's an example of a service? Sure. So you have categories like travel, construction, and financial services, to name a few. On the monthly release, 11 broad categories of services are represented for both exports and imports. All right, got you. I know there's a lot of great detail that's available. So let's talk more about that. So many economic data points we provide are based on North American Industry Classification Systems, or NAICS. But you mentioned commodity classifications. How many commodity classifications exist, and can you explain that? Sure, Amari. But first I'll point out that we provide NAICS-based trade data, too. Basically, so that our data users can compare it more easily with other economic statistics. Furthermore, we also publish by end-use, Standard Industrial Trade Classification, or SITC, Ag Codes, and Advanced Technology Products. Okay, good point. Thanks for clarifying that. Our most detailed data in USA China Online is based on the Schedule B Export Codes and Harmonized Tariff System Import Commodity Codes. There are over 9,000 Schedule B codes for export classification and over, get this, 19,000 Harmonized Tariff Schedule, or HTS, codes used primarily for imports but also for exports. Each of these statistical commodity codes is 10 digits and rooted in a structural classification system where the first six digits are harmonized internationally. Woo! 9,000 export numbers, 19,000 import numbers. I always knew it was a lot, but when you hear the number, it, it just still blows my mind. So with that, how many records does your area process every month? Omari, a lot. We process over 10 million export and import codes per month. Wow. Every month? Yeah. I still regularly go out and talk with companies about the regulations you had mentioned earlier and how to report in the automated commercial environment. It's still staggering how much data we process every month. Given that, what is not captured in this data that sometimes users would assume is included? So from ACE, we collect a variety of information, including, but definitely not limited to, the commodity classification. This code helps us know what the product is and process the data accordingly. The quantity, 
value, shipping weight, method of transportation, for example, air and vessel, and it keeps going. Import duties, customs district and port, country of origin, country of destination, and whether exports are domestically produced or foreign. In all, we collect approximately 80 to 100 different pieces of detailed information on our export and import records, so it appears we get everything. One item that comes to mind that we do not get currently is the country of origin on a foreign export, basically where the good originated when it was imported and then ultimately re-exported out of the U.S. One thing that's interesting, when I provide training for companies, I regularly tell them to make updates as soon as they know them, such as quantity or value or date of export or country of destination. Given that we publish every month and companies may be making changes throughout the year, how do you handle those corrections? Is it monthly or annually? Great question, Amari. As you know, while timely data is very important, of course accuracy is equally important. We are very transparent about statistical corrections and provide complete detailed revisions for goods. We publish revisions for the previous three years every June. So what do those revisions include? These include corrected records and those that were reported too late to be published with the monthly statistics. And say someone contacts us with questions about the data. Our office will actually start an investigation Sounds real official, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So we dig into the data to identify what stands out, and we verify that with the filer. If a correction is needed, we publish it in a table showing what the table lines or data lines should read. These tables are posted on our website as they're completed prior to the June revisions. This is how we balance customer service, timeliness, and accuracy. Oh, interesting. So again, when I'm on the road, I regularly encounter companies that say they received a call from your office looking to verify data or reported information. So that is great background. So now let's actually get into some of the details of the information that was just released. So we just released February 2021 data on April 7th. What's the latest information that you see in the data? Omari, this is always the fun part for us, as all our hard work each month culminates in the release of the monthly economic indicator used by so many. Let me give you some of our recent figures. The international trade deficit for goods and services stands at $71.1 billion, with exports of goods and services at $187.3 billion and imports at $258.3 billion. The deficit for the month increased $3.3 billion from last month and increased $33.1 billion from the same month last year. Have you noticed any interesting trends in the data? What's funny is I'm old enough to remember CDs and cassettes. Even today, some of my coworkers tease me about my DVD collection, which is, you know, just comical to me. Do you see new products emerge or old products just disappear? So since I'm a bit older than you, I remember vinyl records and 8-tracks. Ah, the good old days. You mentioned interesting trends, and I would say that trends in international trade data are basically our life. From continual growth of petroleum exports over the last several years and the decline of our imports of petroleum to the impact of the pandemic on all sectors of international trade, especially the automotive industry, these are trends that are not only interesting but researched by all of our data users. Omari, you know, there's always something interesting going on or in the works. In recent years, we have added the Advanced Economic Indicator Report. This report shows advanced export and import international trade in goods, combined with advanced information for retail and wholesale inventories, and basically provides the public an early snapshot of these vital pieces of indicator data. We are now publishing data for exports by metropolitan area through the quarterly Metro Exports Report. This release looks at the total value exported from the metropolitan areas, from different regions of the U.S., including the Northeast, Midwest, South, and West. That's impressive. I can envision associations and local organizations finding that information very helpful at the metropolitan level. Also, we are always getting requests to look at data in new ways. One of our most recent comes in the form of the China Preliminary Export Report. This report comes out approximately 7 to 10 days prior to our full indicator release and includes export information for certain goods included in the U.S. and China Economic Trade Agreement. I realize government agencies use this information to help shape and track trade policies and economic impact of trade agreements. 
You and I have both worked with trade promotion agencies such as U.S. Commercial Service, International Trade Administration, Small Business Administration, Export Import Bank, just to name a few. Some businesses in the U.S. look to expand their businesses abroad, and our data, along with the help of some of these agencies, can help businesses make informed decisions about entering markets abroad. I think I've heard you mention growth for different products. Can you explain that more? Sure. This seems like a great place to share how USA Trade Online, or UTO, can do all those things. It's a data tool that gives users access to current and cumulative U.S. export and import data. With multiple data sets and capabilities, UTO can assist different types of customers from a wide range of industries and fields. Manufacturers and other businesses wishing to expand their business globally can utilize UTO to identify new markets, evaluate existing markets, and perform other market research tasks, including trends and growth over the last several years. So it's interesting. I've shared some of that information during my training to show the highest growth rates for all different types of products. I attended a healthcare conference a few years ago showing emerging markets for health monitors, breathing devices, and other tools. It was really interesting and really helpful for businesses. Excellent. That's exactly how it can help. The data available through this tool can also support economists in interpreting economic news and performing academic research, as well as assist governments and federal agencies in analyzing domestic and international trade policies. This powerful software allows users to create customized reports and colorful charts detailing international trade data at different levels. All data are updated each month with the release of the latest U.S. International Trade in Goods and Services report. So with all this information, can you talk about the tools for companies or agencies that they can use to help sort through all of this data? Like if someone were just trying to find a new market. For example, someone listening to this podcast may manufacture tables and they're looking for an emerging market. Any recommendation for them? Omari, you know, a focus in international trade is to provide innovative ways to view our data. Recently, We have developed and released an easy-to-use tool called the Global Market Finder, or GMF for short. The GMF is a set of data visualization tools created to help companies identify new export markets overseas. The tool is available for anyone to use. There's no special login information needed for access. In fact, we have information that covers this topic on the Census website in the Census Academy webinars area. It's called How to Classify Your Commodities, Schedule B Search, and Global Market Finder. And it's offered in both English and Spanish. Excellent. That's good. Not stopping there, we have a vast amount of international trade data in the Census Bureau's application programming interface. But most people know this as the API. Sounds real fancy, doesn't it? Yeah, very technical. True, very true. The API allows users to customize statistics in web or mobile applications that provide quick and easy access from various Census Bureau data sets. Not surprising, the API provides the most detailed trade data at published levels between the United States and our international trade partners. Our data users who choose to utilize the International Trade API will have timely access to time series information involving NAICS, end use categories, HS codes, and U.S. port level data, just to name a few. All right. Well, you know what, Matt? Thank you very much for this great overview of the International Trade Program at the Census Bureau. Clearly, this is an exceptional source for anyone looking to learn more about international trade. You have historical information, numerous ways to access timely international trade data, including data tools such as USA Trade Online and the Global Market Finder and several resources and training online. So if you found today's podcast informative and helpful and you would like to learn more, please visit us at census.gov. If you'd like to learn more about international trade data, please visit us at census.gov forward slash trade. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to sharing more with you very soon.